Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Give Life Games channel. I'm your host, Lamont Tyson. I am actually looking sexy as hell in a nice shirt this time. Normally I'm in those gym shirts, but today I'm feeling extra special because I've got one of my top five YouTubers, Mr. Jerry Ward, Bios S3s. Pleasure, man. Gave me the honor of giving me an interview. Got, uh, I'm like a little groupie, man. I'm stoked <laughs> to be standing here with you. When I first got into YouTube trying to get on my weight loss fitness challenge, your channel came up. I enjoyed the information you put out because you kept it real. For those that don't know you, that I'm going to introduce to my channel. Give them a little bit about your background. Well, let's see. I mean, I started my fitness journey, I guess you would call it. I was like 15 years old. I get suspended from high school, and I thought I was going to stay home all day and sleep. And um, next thing you know, my older cousin knocks on my door and says, get out of bed. We're going to go work out. And I was like 15. I had never worked out before, but we had everything in the basement. It was his and his father's that were in my basement. Like, it was a family kind of thing. And um, he made me go down there and train all day. And we did the, we had like the weeder posters with weeder principles and stuff. And I did a few sets of curls and my arms responded very quickly. Like within a couple of sets, they just really pumped up. And I was like, man, that feels pretty good. You know, and he was like, oh man, it's supposed to be a punishment. So we ran through all these circuits all day long. And then um, after that, I would go back down to the basement the next day because I didn't know anything about training. And I would take the dumbbell upstairs, put it under my bed, and I'd do curls before school. Curls after school. <laughs> and by the time I was a senior in high school, this was just a couple of years. You know, I had 16 and 17 inch arms already by the time I was, you know, a senior in high school and was doing my first bodybuilding competition at 17 years old. Good Lord. So I decided uh, at that point, you know, I did my first show, I got spanked, I got crushed. Mm -hmm. And um, I missed 130 pounds on stage and the, uh, the teenager who won, his name was Pete, I'll never forget what he looked like. The guy was like I mean, 200 pounds. I mean, when he stripped down next to me, I was just like, I don't even know if I'm in the right realm right now of what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was like, even though I got my ass kicked, I was like, well, I can be better. And, you know, the guy that was my mentor, Al Thurston, at the time was like, yeah, every year you try to get better. Right. And just be better and better and better. And if you don't win, it's okay because you're trying to get better and you're bettering yourself. So that was kind of instilled in me right from the beginning. Fast forward, I have 22 years competing now. I've switched to physique um, due to different injuries that I've had mm -hmm. that I can no longer train heavy like I used to to maintain that mass. Um, and, yeah, the YouTube thing in 2012, I started doing it and uh, started making videos and piecing together with just stuff on my phone. Mm -hmm. And um, nobody was really watching them. I was putting like a lot of effort into it. Nobody was really watching them until I just kind of stopped trying to be a movie director and mm -hmm. just started being me. Once yeah. I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to make a video saying what I want to say as being me and not try to make this like, you know, professional quality thing. Once I did that, that's when the YouTube thing really started to take off. One, th one thing that you haven't shied away from, you are willing to talk about naturals mm -hmm. versus athletes that use gear mm -hmm. and you've made some some very candid statements and some pointed statements that it's a personal choice yeah it's absolutely i mean in america it's a legal choice too i think that if it was legal like when i go to mexico on vacations not a lot of people use it down in mexico really you know, like it's completely legal not a lot of people using it and then they'll come up to you and be like oh man i'm thinking about working out should i take this stuff and i'm like oh wait a minute that's right it's legal down here it didn't even dawn on me you know like but not a lot of people are using it. But in America, you know, it's like a legal thing right now. But if it were legal, I think that there would be less stigma to it mm -hmm. as far as whether it being good or evil or et cetera. But I think it's a personal choice, not really, you know, necessarily a moral choice. I don't think if you take it, you're wrong for taking it. Right. You know, like let's say you're in another country that's legal. Are you wrong for taking it there if you're not competing in a natural fed? No. So, I mean, it definitely boils down to your personal decisions and what you think is best for you. A lot of people, when they get on their fitness journeys, instead of asking the things I've learned from you, your macros, your micronutrients, how much training you're doing, variety in training, the first thing they say to me is, what supplements you're taking, yeah. or what are you yep. using? What would you say to individuals who have that mindset? Um, well, first of all, it's not their fault. I mean, it's been crammed down their throat since, let's see, 1994, 93. I'm trying to think of when I first started getting involved with the supplement stuff. Like, you see stuff now, like hydroxycut is on TV, mm -hmm. and these different, you know, you go into 7-Eleven, and muscle milk is in 7-Eleven, myoplex is in 7-Eleven and stuff. It's being crammed down your throat because the ads show these people, they're like, I did this in five weeks using this supplement. And they're not saying, I had to train, I had to diet, I had to do cardio and stuff right. with it, you know? So you kind of like have to re-educate people when they come up to you and say, you know, oh, what do you think about this fat burn? I usually tell them flat out, I'm like, unless you're already in single digit body fat and your diet's in check, your cardio's in check, your, you know, your training is in check, you know how to recover and you're doing all the things necessary, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything. And that's the problem. So many people buy it 
And I can't tell you how many, right now, if you're watching this, there are unused portions of fat burners in bottles sitting in cupboards, on shelves, all over the place. Because you take it for maybe a week, a week or two, you're not seeing a whole lot of results, and then you forget to take it, you stop taking it, and it does, it's not working. If it was working, you'd keep taking it. Right. But the problem is your diet's not in check, the training's not in check. And I think that there's definitely been a um, kind of lack of education on training, diet, cardio, and it's been more of how can we, these bigger companies, how can we you know, get a bigger profit margin? How can we make more money? Well, we can make this product for under $10 and sell it for $45. That's a lot different than trying to sell a program, which ultimately, if you sold a program, that program is going to be photocopied and distributed in forums all over the place, and you're not going to make any money. So it's really about making money. It's not about how effective the things are. Check them out, guys, because that is the biggest part of what I'm preaching to all of you. You got to put in the hard work. There's nowhere around unless you're rich and you're a desperate housewife, all that type deal. You're going to go get things taken out and moved. You know, but the, the point that we preach on Life Gains is sustainable life habits. Working out, being physically fit is part of creating a quality of life and enhancing your long-term ability to make money. So now, Jeremy, I ask you just personal things. Who are some of your inspirations? So my two questions about that would be, give me your favorite past lifter, bodybuilder, and your current favorite? I think in my past, the one I looked up to the most, his name was Akim Albrecht. He Ooh. was from Germany. And I remember opening like my first issue of Muscle and Fitness and he was in there. And he was like 285 on stage and he was like this big jacked up guy and he had like these two beautiful girls on his arm. And I was like, <laughs> man, I don't know what it is about that guy, but that guy's cool. Like well, everything about him is cool. And I just remember being like, I wanna be like that. I wanna be that size. And I used to try to, you know, back then we didn't have the internet so you couldn't really, follow these people unless they were in the magazines and they didn't always have him in the magazines so if it wasn't him it was Dorian Yates right and Dorian was the very pale bodybuilder which I was very pale at the time and he was the guy that had the bulldog tattoo on his arm which I was always big into bulldogs like there were all the reasons besides the fact that he was just awesome that I picked up on yeah but also the fact that he didn't talk smack like he wouldn't talk shit in the magazines and stuff he would disappear come back and then prove it mm -hmm. so I kind of say you know do the same thing like when I was training I wouldn't train in the tank top I'd stay covered up and train because I knew some of the other competitors that would maybe come into my gym that I might be competing against would see me. And I would kind of emulate Dorian from as far as that. As far as nowadays, I mean, I honestly, I haven't really been following um, bodybuilding to the point where it's like, it's not, I don't pick a bodybuilder and are motivated by the bodybuilder anymore. I'm mo more self-motivated now than mm -hmm. I was back when I was younger. Um, if I had to pick my favorite bodybuilder nowadays, it would have to be... It's a toss-up between Phil Heath and um, Steve Kuklo, two guys that are big but have really good symmetry, shape, and come in dialed. So they're more of what I feel like the aesthetic mass together look should be. Mm -hmm. um, two inspiring physiques are them. Or Dennis Newman was a big inspiration back in the day too. Dennis was, I mean, hands down, what I feel like up to this point still, the ultimate physique as far as bodybuilding, how the ultimate look. Um, More ultimate, so than Frank Zane? I think, yeah, but because Frank Zane to me, personally, I've always been a smaller guy. So for me, I always, the big, the idea of being bigger always appealed to me. Okay. So I went towards okay. a bigger guy. I'm sure gotcha. if I was a bigger guy that, you know, the smaller guys would appeal to me. Um, but it was like, you know, as far as, you know, mass, size, conditioning, the look, he looked like Superman. Like, it, it just kind of all fit. And, you know, to me, Dennis, probably throughout time would be like the ultimate, the ultimate bodybuilder as far as physique and look. Gotcha. As we try to wind down this interview, and, and just thank you for giving me your time. Absolutely. Let the people know what, what goals you're reaching for this year and what things you've got coming up in your short-term future that they can follow you and support you in. A week from today, I'll be competing in the Max Muscle um, show in Woodbridge, Virginia. Um, I've switched to physique now. I tore my rotator cuff right before the Olympia last year. And when I got back from the Olympia, I decided I was going to keep pushing it because I didn't know it was torn. I just knew it had some pain. Mm -hmm. I wound up tearing the bicep tendon as well. So now after that was healed, I couldn't train for almost two months. After that was healed, I just can't handle the weights anymore. I can't handle the heavy weights. And without the heavy weights, pounding the food just makes me fat. So there's no point in trying to be 240 if it's 240 with 36-inch weights. There's no point. So I kind of trimmed down a little bit and um, have gone more towards the physique now. And, um, you know, I think it's important as you, you get older and you evolve, that you never just stay, stay stagnant. I know guys now that are in their 50s that are still trying to push bigger, 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 and you know what? They're getting health complications. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? High blood pressure. They're having problems with their kidneys. They're having problems with their cholesterol. They're having all these issues. Type 2 onset of adult diabetes, they're having issues with that because they just can't 
wrap it around their heads that they can't be 250 pounds for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. So I'll be 40 this year. I said that, you know, after my rotator cuff, I was like, look, I'm going to be 40. I need to evolve. I need to keep doing what I like to do, but I need to find another way to do it. Mm-hmm. So now what I'm going to do is try to come back from the injury, be in the best shape I've ever been in my entire life and head in a new direction, but wrap my head around the, the whole idea of not being as big as humanly possible, which, you know, you're training for 20 something years. Mm-hmm to get bigger all of a sudden now it's like you know the judges told me at the last show i needed to get smaller i need to drop muscle so now i'm sitting at 178 pounds as of this morning as opposed to the 240 i was at you know four months ago it's um mentally it kind of weighs on you a little bit but i like trying to push myself mentally it mentally makes me stronger to look in the mirror and say no i'm not that guy with the the muscle that i had but i'm still that guy if that makes any sense oh man yeah so, yeah like you know a good friend of mine kevin lavroni when he uh stopped competing he stepped away and walked out of the gym and completely lost all the muscle Mm -hmm. people were like you know like why doesn't he stay big he was so secure in himself enough already that the muscles are not what made him that's not what made him who he was he was what made him who he was Mm -hmm. i didn't understand that at the time but i'm getting that now as i get older so you guys this is what 178 pounds looked like. <laughs> Y'all followed me last week and I weighed in for that gold challenge. I was 186 then, still 187 now. This guy looks bigger than me, more than me. Learn from these people. Learn from the individuals that are a little older, that have been through it, such as him, William Powell, as they evolve and do other things to stay in shape because at the end of the day, I'm learning from these guys. It's not about how big you are. It's about how fit you are. It's about the quality of life. It's about being able to be mobile and enjoying life. Tell the people how they can reach out to you. Uh, BioWestertraining at gmail.com. You can hit me on there. I answer all my own emails. The only ones I don't answer is if you're asking me to sell you drugs or if you're asking me about (laughs) drugs. If you ask me those things, I just automatically delete them and don't even read them. Um, You can hit me on my website, BioWestertraining.com. It's just going to direct you back to the other one. You hit the email anyway. So, so guys, I'm going to ask him, can we do his outro that he does on his channel? Now, my, I'm <laughs> going to do the bicep. My bicep is a little bit, but we're going to do it. Show him how you, you get out on your intros. This is the Gold's Gym Challenge bicep, and we're out. We're out.